Ladies and gentlemen, our second session um, of two speakers concentrates on the methodological and technical side of the projects we've heard and their applicability to the future research. And our first speaker um, is Alex Bayless, <coughs> again one of the two principal researchers on the Radio Carbon project, who I'm delighted to welcome as an old colleague. She splits her time between acting as head of scientific data in British Heritage and professor of archaeological science at the University of Stirling. Alex. Hi then, everybody. <coughs> How do we do this? I must say that originally I wanted to try and widen this a bit and talk about how to do Bayesian chronologies in the early medieval period. And I wanted to look more widely, both outside Anglo Saxon England chronologically, but also maybe you know, expand it a little bit in terms of period, but also expand it in terms of area. Uh, that's just too much to shoehorn into 25 minutes. So one of the things I'd like to start is if there are issues that are relevant to radiocarbon dating that are true if you're in Schleswig, which are not true if you're in England. So there are other issues that I'm not going to cover in this talk that's, that in other places you would like me to think about. Okay, so just to, with that caveat in mind for our continental colleagues. Um, Okay, so potential and pitfalls. Okay, so we start with a radiocarbon date. And as you all know, you have to calibrate radiocarbon dates. They turn from this nice, precise, normal distribution going through a calibration curve that is uh, made up of known age tree rings, you know, empirical, and you end up with this very humpy, in unfriendly little probability distribution that actually, John, probably goes from 350 AD to 700 AD. Is it true since which conquest? Okay, so that's our starting point. So of limited utility in the Anglo-Saxon period, a very expensive way of telling you it's Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> so we don't do that anymore. Now, how do I make my talk work? Okay, so you get a load of radiocarbon dates, for example, and so these are fake radiocarbon dates. I made up what the answer was and did that calibration process backwards to give you the kind of radiocarbon you would get, given the kind of typical errors you would now get on a radiocarbon date. So this bottom site begins in AD 530, it ends in AD 630. Okay. Maybe you would have thought, oh, these are outliers, maybe it starts a bit later, maybe, but that you would, if you'd looked at that graph, you'd probably say the same. Something like that. If you look at the top graph, you'd probably say something similar. But the top graph, oh, sorry, that bottom side was used for 100 years, the top site began in 575, ended in 600, and we used it for 20, 25 years. Now the problem, if you just look at a graph of calibrated radiocarbon dates, you can't tell the difference between site B and site A. You can't tell whether or not this is real duration in the archaeology, or whether it's actually just scattered, scattered, analyzed in statistics. So you need our hero of the day, Thomas Bayes. Okay, promise the only equation. <laughs> Forget all that bit at the top, that's just techno geek. What this means is, you've got a set of information about a problem, a new set of information about the problem. In this case, some scientific dating, some radiocarbon dates, could be some luminescence dates, could be some coin dates. Okay. Then you have other information about the problem. This is Sam's stamp dialects or um, the, the, all these pots must be the same date because they're in the same grade bit. There's archaeological information. The mathematicians think we're brilliant. Archaeologists know so much about the data of their sites before they start. You know, they have stratigraphy. They know site deposit A is earlier than deposit B. That is incredibly powerful information. What this horrible piece of mathematics does is allow you to put the two things together to come up with an answer. An answer that's no longer scientifically independent, it's not just something the physicist tells you, 
but it is the combined answer that includes both the archaeological information and the scientific information. But if you don't get both the archaeological information and the scientific information right, you won't get the right answer. So that's the trick, the technique. Okay, so take a simple example. Say we have two radiocarbon dates. These are two graves. The top grave cuts the feet of the bottom grave. So we know that this one is later than that one. So what we do is we throw away those two radiocarbon dates, take a year at random, and we recalculate the probability there. Take another year at random, recalculate the probability. Until we've done it all the years. Then we throw it all away and we do it again. Then we throw it all away and we do it again. Then we throw it all away and we do it again. Eventually, if you're the Anglo-Saxon women 600 million calculations later, you come up with a stable answer that doesn't change. And what that does is includes the extra information from the stratigraphy with the radiocarbon dates. So you get this thing, the thing in colour in our graphs, usually in black in the graphs I'm going to show, that is what is known as a posterior density estimate. It is the squashed date. It is the radiocarbon date that has been contaminated by our archaeological opinions. Okay, the bit in white is our nice independent scientific measurement that hey, was fairly useless, but at least was independent of our archaeological opinions. Okay, so this is sort of fairly obvious archaeological information. But we have other archaeological information. Say, for example, I have a, a long house, a round house, say. Okay. This house is built at some point in time. It's used for a while, and then it goes out of use. There is a real period in the past, a real Thursday afternoon, when someone built the house. They then lived in it, and there's a real Friday afternoon when it burnt down. What we want to know is, what are the dates of those two things, those two events? Okay. Some fairy godmother, English heritage, pays for a schedule of the radiocarbon date. Who ends up with that? Okay. Now, that is not very useful in that, again, these are simulations, so these scatter before and after the real dates of interest. The reason they scatter is because there is a mathematical assumption in calibrating a radiocarbon date that you don't realise you're making when you calibrate it. When you have one radiocarbon date, you assume that is equally likely to date to any period of the calibration curve, so that anywhere between 1950 AD and 40,000 BC. If you've got one radiocarbon date, that might be true. But as soon as you have a second radiocarbon date from the same site, well, if you've got an Anglo-Saxon radiocarbon date, the chances are you're going to get a second Anglo-Saxon radiocarbon date. The probability of it being Neanderthal is much lower than, you know, because you're on an Anglo-Saxon site. Subsequent dates are related because it's from the same site, it's associated with the same kind of pottery or whatever. So we have to deal with this relationship that we have between groups of radiocarbon dates, which we do with a fuzzy bit of mathematics of which I'm not going to scare you here. But we, when we do it, what we can do is assess how much of this duration is real duration, how much of the scatter is real the number of years this house was in use for, and how much was actually just the scatter on the radiocarbon measure. So here, now, what we've done here then, though, is something else. Here is another posterior density estimate, but this is no longer a squashed radiocarbon date. This is actually what we want to know. That is, this is our date estimate for when this house was built. This is our date estimate for when this house went out of use. If I compare the two, I can tell you how long the house was in use for. And so then, obviously, this is a simulation, so this is an iron age example, or whatever. So if I go back to my initial simulation, where I had the two sites, when I actually just use that simple piece of mathematics that, assume, you know, that says that these dates are all related, they're all from the same site, then I can tell the difference between this site that began in 530 and ended in 630, and this site that began in 575 and ended in 600. So that's the basis 
of everything we do in radiocarbon dating nowadays. This is what you have to do to make this happen. This is forged out of 25 years worth of experience and 7,000 radiocarbon dates. Okay. I'm really not going to tell you about the mechanics of it today. I want to think about defining the problems. Because one of the things I'd like to, you to come away with today is that this is giving you the precision you need to be useful is absolutely on the scientific edge of what is possible in radiocarbon dating. So everything has to be right. And I have to, I pick my ground. You know, I probably say no to 70% of sites of this period that come across my desk, and yes to 30%. Because I, you know, the, the trick is to know before you start whether or not you're going to get an answer that's useful, or are likely to get an answer that's useful. This is our friend and our foe. This is the current ground of the calibration curve. Again, I don't have time to go into this in detail. But suffice it to say that this is currently decadal. One day it would be nice to have single year data all the way back here. It would give us more refinement. This curve is a bit different from the one we showed in, in 1998 when we started it. The actual steep bit starts a bit earlier than previously was thought, probably back into about 550. There is this nasty bit between 450 and sort of 570, mm -hmm. about which you would have to be very clever if you ever wanted to tackle that. And again, there's less flat, but, but still but flat but bumpy bits in the 8th and the 9th century. But it's quite easy to tell the 8th from the 9th century. Well, easy. Not if you get a single radiocarbon date calibrated, but if you have a model, it's very easy. Okay. Having said this, the radiocarbon date is very good, very good at telling you the basics. It is Anglo-Saxon. This is a set of dikes somewhere in Cambridgeshire. It was known to be Anglo-Saxon before this project, you know, before this application. Could have been Iron Age. Well, it is. Okay, probably not much better than it is an early Anglo-Saxon set of dikes. I can't tell <coughs> you which decades it was built in. But that's better than not knowing if it's Iron Age. Fish traps around the coast. You know, there are lots of medieval or middle Saxon fish traps from the Thames in London. We wouldn't know that without radiocarbon dating. Don't forget that radiocarbon dating is good at confirming that it's Saxon when you don't know that. Then this is the sort of where we started really, picking my ground, high precision radiocarbon dating on that nice steep bit of curve in the 7th century. So this is Ipswich Bus Market, which is probably the first thing we ever did, uh, 7th century cemetery. Um, we can look at using those dates on how the cemetery develops over time. You know, do we have grave, you know, family groups, all the rest of it. Um, we did another 7th century cemetery. Here we did a 7th century cemetery, but we've also got a 9th century cemetery, which is interesting. Little great book. This is our missing patch. This is after the end of furnished burials and before the establishment of the churchyards, and where the hell are all the burials? Well, there's a little group here at Stratton, which you wouldn't have known, you know, just unaccompanied inhumations, extended inhumations, and a little group via <coughs> the village. Uh, this is some old dates from Henley Wood in Somerset. Again, I wouldn't possibly put all that much money on the accuracy of these, but they're not too bad. It's probably a 5th and 6th century cemetery. It's in Somerset. You tell me what the archaeology of the Dark Ages looks like once you get out of the Anglo-Saxon cultural sphere. You know, at least we can find it. Uh, this is a, another model I've done for St Paul in the Vale of Lincoln. Probably now, if we went back and read of this, we could unravel the foundation date of those early churches. And, you know, there's quite a lot of controversy about that. These dates are probably, you know, they were done in the late 80s. It was a good idea, but probably the technology wasn't quite there. But, you know, that, this sort of thing is within reach now. But then we have, you know, these are site-based studies. You have, it's all from the same site, you might have some stratigraphy. Here we have the sequence from the seriation. You've seen this. 
Is it accurate? Okay, so here's the pitfalls. I've been talking about dating human bones so far. Well, this is the date of phase whatever it is. This is, I am told by my esteemed colleagues, the date of the various continental burials. This is a dendro date. This is several ostrographic coins. These are single coin dates. It all looks like maybe it is a complete fiction. You know, we're, that looks okay. Um, this is just so that I show you that as an artifact, because by now you might be feeling surprised. Okay. <laughs> that's it, that's it. That's, there's only one more brooch in the whole thing. Okay. Using that model, which is just, you know, the, 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 the normal model, it would give us a date for something like that, which would be consistent with it being Red World's world, we believe it's Red World. Okay, so I'm essays from henceforward. First complication, you are what you eat. Now, I have, this is where I would say one thing is that we are very lucky in Britain. We ha in England, I have seen practically no significant, you know, measurable dietary offsets from the Neolithic to at least the Viking period. If I was in the Trichterbank ceramic in northern Germany, that would not be true. We would be talking of significant offsets of several hundred years. We have got nothing remotely approaching that. And this, you know, you can see from this isotope graph, all of these people don't need to have eaten any fish. They could easily just have been quite substantial carnivores. They like their both big. But we don't know. We did a mixture model to see that. If we do our mixture model, our grains move there. Well, again, it's not impossible. Maybe the kind of kit they had in Germany and, and France was a little bit earlier in Germany and France. It took a generation before it got to us in the provinces. Don't know. Okay, but something to be worried about. Then, again, some who would move to there. Well, there are people who'd be very happy with that graph. Um, it doesn't have to be a dietary offset, though. You know, it takes time for your food to get into your bones. We're dating your bones. You know, if you're 30 or 40 years old, you're probably a decade old, just because it takes a decade for your food to get into your bones. If I'm... Nowadays, I'd have to do this on AMS. Almost all the high-precision data labs in the world are shut. That's what reproducibility should look like. It scatters either side of zero. That's what it looks like for bones. Okay. Do we have the accuracy we need to do this with AMS? Here is uh, Tranmarona, I believe is the name of the site. Some cremations at Sun Hill. Looks like it's going to work beautifully. You know, here we are, third quarter of the 6th century. But is calcine bone dating reliable? This is a, a, a cremation with a dendrodated coffin cut down in 1370 BC. It's probably 50 years too old. Is that because it's in Denmark and they're eating a lot of fish, and even though structural carbonate has less of an offset than collagen, there still might be a bit of a dietary effect? Or is it that the structural carbonate has taken up old wood from the cremation process? Uh, we don't know. Here we are, I can date sludge. Okay, it's difficult, you need macro fossils. But here is, I can tell you when they, which king of Wessex was on the throne when they planted the vineyard at Market Lavington in Wiltshire. A whole new kind of archaeology, archaeological information is available to you on the kind of resolution you need. Uh, but the technical nightmare of floating bulk sediment we won't go into here. This is a long stratigraphic sequence in the fort at uh, Binchester in um, County Durham. Uh, th there's a, 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 a brooch that Rose and Pratt tells me dates to 550 up here, and a coin of magnetics down here. Hey, continuity, everybody very excited. But look, that entire three metres of strat goes into maybe 30 years, finishing 420. Continuity, my aunt Sally. Tintagel, again, we're in, the, we're in the West where we, know, we don't know anything. Well, it's, it's been. 5th and 6th century activity at Tintagel. Here is a lot of industrial activity. This is charcoal burning between the 7th and uh, 8th centuries at Westfall Quarry in Dorset. Uh, I don't know whether we'll go any further with this. This is, can we date the 
charred food on pots. Charred food can be gula bays, it doesn't have to be lamb stew, so we need to worry about that. Also, one in eight days will be just completely bonkers wrong, for reasons we don't understand, but they're fairly easy to spot. Is this worth the money? You know, the late chaff tempered pottery is later than the early whatever it is. There's a big period of overlap. Here, maybe we can have enough, quite enough samples. Maybe we do this on a regional basis. Depends how interested you are in pots. Um, London way. Okay, this is a model that determines when, when Ipswich ware is introduced into London. The answer is the 520s or the 720s or the 730s. Okay, is that true in Ipswich? If we did that in Ipswich, would we get the same answer? If we did that in Southampton, would we get the same answer? If well, I don't know where else we might do it. There are other big questions here. We could, for example, date all the earliest sites in London Wick. Is London Wick a, a clan settlement that establishes a clan by the political will of some individual king? If so, can we tell you when? So there is potential here. This is a, 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 a settlement at Yarnton in Oxfordshire. It's 9th century. They didn't know that. Here is West Hesperton. We spent quite a long time, time and effort telling you that it starts at the end of the 5th century and goes on to the middle of the 9th century. Um, but it moves, you know, the early stuff is in the north and in the middle area, but the, here in the south, you know, you're 700. So it's, it's shifting. This <coughs> uh, how long does the group have to take to fill up? The answer is a decade or two at most, except occasionally when they really do seem to silt up very slowly. But most of them are very quick. Um, so conclusion, this is deeply difficult. Phone a friend, do <laughs> one to come. <laughs> Pick your ground, simulate before you start, look at what samples you've got before you start. You know, you're probably doing for half the work before you spend any money on radiocarbon dates because you want to know that you've got a good chance of giving a chronology that is of a useful precision for you before you actually spend any money. And finally, beware of the ancient tax. <laughs>
actually estimating from isotopes is the best way forward, or whether it's actually better to try and extract essential amino acids that don't that come from carbohydrates in the diet rather than protein in the diet. But there's you know very, very experimental. Nobody's giving you errors on those kinds of questions that are remotely of use to you. You know, we are back to which conquest job, you know, if we lack that information. So, you know, yes, we don't know. Uh, but the, the date, the, the samples I've got, there's no relationship with um, with age. It's the, the higher nitrogens are from Mill Hill and Buckton Dover and sites near the coast in Kent. And then also what we think might be a freshwater rather than a marine signal from Castle Bay. And then when you go to the publishing, do you say which bone elements is radiocarbon? Yes. But usually, 80% is going. Yeah. Could I just check with what you're saying about the chopping the isotopes? Is that something that's automatically done as part of the radiocarbon, or is it something additional you have to do? Okay, that depends on your laboratory. Um, a few laboratories, everybody work well. Okay. Is that a really complicated question? Sorry. Okay, sorry. There's two kinds of carbon isotope of carbon measurements, carbon stable isotope measurements. There's the one that are done in the AMS. They are routinely done, and they will give them to you, but they have nothing to do with diet. That's to do with how your AMS machine is working. Okay. There's another kind that some labs actually report to you, even though they use the other kind to actually calculate the age. So, for example, Oxford do that, or Okay, Glasgow, for example, would do, um, would uh, measure the, would give you the dietary delta C13, but use, and use that for age calculation. Um, somewhere like Poznan or Kiel will give you the AMS delta C13 measurement and will only do delta C13 and possibly delta 15N if you pay for it separately. You know, beta analytic will only do it if you pay for it separately. So it entirely depends on your laboratory what you get. Generally, if you commission separate isotopic studies, they will be more precise because the whole scientific kit will be determined, you know, will be organised for dietary studies rather than for radiocarbon dating. Can I encourage people who have very specific technical questions <laughs> to approach Alex over lunch? So we have some questions over here, I think. Okay, Peter. Uh, uh, Peter Fowler. Peter, there's a microphone. It's on. Uh, and, uh, Peter Fowler. Um, I hesitate to say anything in this particular assembly because I've come to learn from the West, as it were. But Alex did throw down the challenge with a throwaway remark, what do we know about the West in this period? And then she made it worse by saying nothing. <laughs> Very briefly, we have, we have 45 hill forts we have shrines, we have temples, we have Roman temples going, uh, uh, villas going on into the, well into the 5th century. Roman pottery goes on into the middle of the 5th century, which is quite useful. We have coins going on nearly as long as that. We have dikes, like your fleet dike, and we have east and west uh, one side. But above all, of course, from the dating point of view, we have imported Mediterranean pottery. And we have a key dates, uh, dates in the 6th century in particular relating to that. I won't go on, but I hope I've made the point that we do actually know quite a lot about the West in this period. The real challenge, if I may say so, and we were discussing this over coffee, is to bring those two very separate worlds together. Yep, agree. Rob and then Clifford. Rob Collins. Given the problems with the calibration curve in the 5th century, is there any sort of modeling or uh, methods that can be used to try and overcome that, that flat uh, weekly curve? Okay, I mean, the kind of seriation that we, I mean, maybe Britain is not the place to do it, okay, and maybe we need to wait until finding out whether or not cremated bone dates are good enough. But I could see a day, for example, where the Spong Hill urns, you take the decorative motifs on the Spong Hill urns, <coughs> do a correspondence analysis of decorative motifs, versus which pot they appear on to, to get a series of the pots and then you date the, the cremations from within the pots. I wouldn't do that until we've sorted out whether or not cremated bone dating is accurate. You might be better off going with twigs out of the whatever little bits of pie material you have left in there, but there's nothing. So, but that sort of thing, 
but you would need, you really, really have to pick your ground. Don't just get a date because you think it's 5th century, you think it's early and you'd like to confirm that, because you'll get nowhere. <coughs> I've got time for one more question. Uh, Clifford. Clifford Sophia, in the redating projects, um, how did you turn the uh, typology seriation into priors for the Bayesian analysis? And in particular, um, are you able to be sensitive as to how certain you are that um, one grade is earlier or later than another? We only, right, we only modeled the phased seriations. And in fact, we, we modeled the phased seriations, you know, right from sort of about probably 2000 as the typologies emerged. So the typologies were tweaked to be chronologically sensitive you know, during the sort of iterative process of the project. Um, so I never actually really said, is this grade earlier than that grade? It's a matter of whether the partition is, is um, wh where the partitions were, that, that was what we tested. And we did test, you know, two different ways of partitioning the correspondence analysis. And something like 100 correspondence, you know, there are 100 models in chapter seven. I know because most of them took a month to run. <laughs> So all of our great frustration. Thank you very much, Alec.